So uh, my goal today is uh, to teach you about a new uh, open source library, not so new actually, but improving, and talk a bit about really what is the state of the art in natural language understanding kind of this week, uh, and how can you apply it in your project today. So uh, we're going to talk a, a bit about what do we mean by NLP and natural language understanding, kind of when do you need it, when you can get by with other stuff, uh, and then we're going to talk about performance and scale. Uh, what is the state of the art in terms of how fast this thing can actually go? We're going to talk about state of the art accuracy. Okay, kind of how far have we reached in terms of other systems can actually perform. And uh, we're going to talk a bit about best practices uh, that you should consider when you design your own projects. Uh, if you have any questions, please just kind of raise your head and let, let's do it as we go. Okay? So, uh, natural language understanding. When we started, as an industry to talk about doing cool things with text, we started with search, right? And you, you were able to write those, uh, uh, you know, you were able to index a whole set of documents and write queries, and, and it got kind of complicated when you can do error, uh, you know, and uh, a not, and, and, and look at, you know, correct spelling mistakes and do auto suggest and do those kinds of things. Uh, and it was pretty basic because it was keyboard based, but it was, it was so much better than reading the documents one by one, which is what we did before. Uh, so we spent about a decade j just working on search and indexing and tokenization and, and kind of and reverse, uh, reverse indices. And uh, we, we, you know, we spent a lot of time on making them robust, making them scalable, looking at different types of ways to do ranking, right? So, so if a word appears in, in, a, you know, in an HTML title, it's more important than if it appears in the text, uh, right? Those kinds of things. Uh, and we, we, we made it work on PDFs and Word documents. Uh, we, we did tokenization in multiple languages, um, and we, uh, you know, and we, we and, and that, that took a while, and that was kind of the first stage, uh, which we still use. After that, we, we moved into smarter things, and that was still probably about, you know, 15 years ago, uh, and, and obviously there are still projects today use the technology around semantic search. So all of these are actual queries uh, that, you know, if you put into Google US, you get, you, you get the results you expect. Okay, so, so a cheap red prom dress uh, will actually show you uh, dresses that you know, could conceivably be prom dresses. Okay, a uh, cheap for a dress means something different than cheap for a car or cheap for, for a computer, right? Uh, red obviously is a very fuzzy concept, right? Especially if you need to get it from the image. Uh, but what you have now, when you index, uh, you can know that, oh, if I'm looking for a laptop or a movie or a restaurant, Right, then, then basically, oh, that's domain specific things. People care about those very specific facets, right? Uh, so if it's a restaurant, I care about cuisine, I care about where it is, I care about whether it's open. If it's NBA scores, obviously I, I, I'll get a different results by the day or month where I'm, where I'm asking the question. Uh, so I need to uh, index things correctly, and then I need to uh, classify each query. Oh, this is a sports query, and then I ask, kind of, I ask the question accordingly. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is the next level, okay, when I actually need to understand language. Okay, so, so for example, if you look at this example, uh, if I'm, uh, I need to differentiate between does Jane have the flu, does Jane not have the flu, does Jane maybe have the flu, uh, does Jane's sister have the flu, or did Jane have the flu last year? Okay, uh, and this is obviously for, in a clinical context, extremely important. Like, do you have the disease or do you not have the disease, right? If I'm trying to see if you should be vaccinated, if you um, fit a clinical trial, if you are at risk, right? I need to know if it's chronic or current, if it's family history or if it's you. Uh, to do that now, uh, I really need to understand English grammar, okay? So, so I need to understand how do you say in English that something, how do, how do you do negation in English? Okay, how do you do maybe in English? How do you do combined sentences, com uh, compound sentences? So this and this and this. Okay, and there are hundreds of ways to say that something is not happening in the English language. Okay, uh, it's, it's domain specific, so in healthcare they do crazy things, like, you know, results are uh, insignificant or, or inconclusive, or, uh, and, and really, uh, you know, you can go years and still find new patterns of ways to say that things may be happening, uh, things happen in a certain temporal way. Uh, you need, you start looking at NLP algorithms, so I need to know that uh, if she's not vaccinated, that she refers to Jane, so that's a co-reference resolution problem. I need to know that RIDT uh, is the test for, uh, for influenza. Therefore, if the test is negative, it means that you don't have it, right? And sometimes the reverse. If the test is positive, it means you don't have it. And obviously, it depends on having some domain knowledge. Uh, I need to be able to do entity uh, uh, recognition, so recognize that Jane is a person, 
and influenza is a, is a disease. And, uh, and really, that's where, the, that's where NLP and NEU algorithms fit in. Okay, uh, so, so, you know, so we'll, we'll, because if you look at this example, anything keyboard, keyword based will give you nothing. Okay, all of these talk about flu or influenza, uh, right, but none of them answer what you actually care about. Uh, so, language understanding, real language understanding is hard. Uh, in a sense, uh, it's so hard that uh, natural language understanding is considered one of the AI complete problems. Okay, so it's a, it's a word play or, or, or MP complete that's fuzzier, but basically means that, look, if you can actually, if you can really understand human language, you've solved strong AI. Okay, uh, which in, makes sense because if you think about it, language is the main way we communicate as a species. Okay, like we do other things, we, we dance, we kiss, we paint, right? There's other ways to communicate, but the main way we communicate is, you know, we speak, we read, and we write. Okay, uh, and, and here's the problem. So, so human language is very nuanced. Okay, so, so here are some ways to say that I agree with you. Okay, if you Google it, 500 ways to say I agree, 500 ways to say I love you, there's more than 500. Okay, uh, because the, the point, when I say I agree with you, that's not the only thing I'm saying. I'm saying how I feel about it, I'm saying how I feel about you, right? These are much more nuanced answers, right? Because that, that's how we need to run our life. Uh, human language is also very fuzzy, okay? And, and it's not that you know, concepts of love and hate are fuzzy, okay? The, the concepts of you know, verbs are fuzzy, okay? So when I tell you to do something, what does it mean? It means that I talk to you, that I send you an email, right? That I write, how many times do you expect to follow up? What does it mean? Okay, when I say that something is blue, what does it mean? Okay, when I say do something to a document or an invoice, what, what is it? Is it a physical thing, a digital thing? What do you actually need to do? Right? These are things that are very context specific. Okay, so the problem when you try to really understand what's going on, it's like forget the, you know, the, the philosophical aspects of life. The core verbs and nouns that we assume are obvious are not obvious. Okay, almost on every, every noun, verb, or, or uh, pronoun. Uh, human language is very, very context specific. Okay, so, so for example, do you know what it means when a patient writes uh, in somebody, in a patient, uh, when a doctor writes in a patient record, patient denies alcohol abuse? It means one thing. What is it? Exactly. It means this is a textbook alcoholic. Right? It means I suspect alcohol abuse. Okay, and you should actually extract this as a, as a positive, as a possible positive. Okay, the reason you have to write it this way is because patients have access to their medical records. You can request it. Okay, so as a doctor, I cannot just write, oh, this is a textbook alcoholic, recommend blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's just not how you do it. It's not, you know, good bedside manner and all. Okay, and on the other hand, you also, you don't write nothing. Okay, uh, because I don't want someone to be admitted and, and get medication that conflicts with alcohol and kills them. Okay, uh, because the patient denies alcohol, which is actually a very valid symptom on alcoholism and, uh, you know, which we want to treat for. Okay, so what, what you need to know is that in the context of writing your patient record in a computerized way by this person for reading by these people, this is how you write this specific thing. Okay, and, and if you're not in healthcare, you say, look, you, you know, you, you're in a work environment, and I'm sure you've all had discussion, oh, look, for this presentation, for this email, this is how you write it. Okay, because this is the context, this is who's writing it, this is who's reading it. Okay, we do this all the time. Human language is obviously medium specific, so if you say sounds good to me, see you in 15, it's probably 15 minutes. I probably need to, don't need to say where or, where, or, you know, where or how, okay, and this is SMS. Human language is also domain specific, so this long text is taken from a Netflix SEC filing. Uh, it does not actually say anything, <laughs> right, not really. <laughs> it's, it's boilerplate uh, legal text. Right, so, so if you have things like texts that, that are shorter than they need to be, don't use full sentences. In the you know, finance and legal space, you, know, you have a 165 page document uh, that whose entire purpose is to hide the fact that I have to disclose in page 67 that there's a new voting class, right? And, and you have all of that. Uh, and also you need to understand that, yeah, these may be valid sentences, there's no content. So, um, we, we, the goal is to solve this problem, right? Is to go into those use cases where we, we don't just want to extract keywords or regular expression, we want to, to really understand. Okay? So what, does this, what is this filing about? Okay? Is this social media post, is it uh, you know, offensive or not offensive? Right? It's not about whether it has a keyword. 
okay, you know, is this patient a fit for this clinical trial? Right? Do we need to escalate this customer support query and, and so on? Uh, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about a library called Spark NLP, uh, which is an open source library, uh, which we started a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, the goal of the library, when we started, it was really to provide state-of-the-art NLP to the open source community uh, for, for Python and for Scala. Uh, and it's been, say it's been fairly successful in terms of actual use, and now production use, and building a community, and so on. Uh, first goal uh, was to substantially, substantially improve the performance and the scale uh, that you can get when you build NLP applications. Second goal was accuracy. Uh, because the, the, you know, in the last two or three years, you may have not noticed, but it was kind of a deep learning revolution, right? So I don't know if you, you know, some people talk about it. Uh, but, but really, it means that uh, if really, if you want to work on the highest accuracy models now, uh, really, everything that was written more than three years ago uh, is just not the most accurate by far. Okay, and it used to be close, and it used to be in some circumstances, that's just no longer the case. Uh, and we wanted something that would absolutely be enterprise grade, so you know we, we get paid to, to write code, and we work in finance and healthcare and pharma, where it's kind of you know like no bullshit high compliance industries, uh, so the thing has to work. Um, so the library is called Spark NLP because it's it's built directly on top of the Apache Spark ML APIs, okay? Which as you see, it's, it makes life actually really easy in terms of just reuse simplicity of the API in some cases, okay? But when we talk, for example, about an NLP pipeline. Like the pipeline class is spark.ml.pipeline. Okay, so this does not need its own pipeline class. Uh, so you get a lot of benefits in terms of performance, realization, reproducibility, uh, those types of really nice things. Uh, it's Apache 2 license, right? So it's kind of commercially free, open source, uh, no, you know, no asterisks. And, uh, uh, and, and it's definitely it's actively developed. So, so now there, there's a full team uh, that's been paid to build it every day. And, and there's really been a good community uh, so just in 2018, there were 25 new releases. Okay, so really every you know every two to three weeks, there's a new release with new functionality. So, uh, questions so far? Okay, so let's talk about performance, uh, and 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 really what the problem was, and we we, we started this uh, after uh, you know we we spent kind of three four years trying to build our own NLP. Uh, pipelines at scale, uh, you know, starting in 2012 for the, for, for the medical industry, and tried everything. So we tried UEMA, and Gate, and CTEX, and, uh, uh, you know, and Spacey, and LTK, and, and, and really anything that was available in any language, uh, commercial as well, uh, and ended up building our own. Specifically, when you want to distribute things, and you run into the issue uh, of, okay, how do you actually load large models uh, at scale? And actually, actually, you work with distributed memory uh, settings. Uh, it's been it's been difficult to the point of having to write our own. Uh, and here's where you are today. If you if you want to use Spark, but uh, you you're finding yourself uh, basically getting a bit. You know, what you'll find is that you get very bad results performance-wise with very highly optimized libraries. Okay, and for example, what a lot of things uh, what a lot of people do today is kind of try to combine Spark, for example, with Spacey. Right on the Python side, uh, and this slide is is from uh, so almost three years ago. Uh, this is from a talk about uh, TensorFlow. So how do you combine? How do you do TensorFlow and Spark? Uh, and I uh, shamelessly stole it with with credit, but still, uh, because what we're talking about the exact same exact same problem that led to writing TensorFlow. So the problem is is that you have your data frames in Spark. Okay, so data frames are in the JVM, highly highly optimized. So Spark does its own memory management. Uh, right, its own caching, uh, its own uh, uh, planning on when to distribute the memory, uh, and, and the data, the, your data frame is in the JVM. Uh, and now you need to, uh, let's say you want to do tokenization, so you call a Python function to do that. Okay, and within Python, it's also, it's highly optimized, right? So either working with, you know, kind of optimized C code, or in, you know, in case of TensorFlow, TensorFlow is, is it, has its own optimizations in C. Uh, the problem is that most of the time, what you are doing is, is you're taking your highly optimized uh, you know, memory structure in the JVM, you're serializing it, you're moving it via inter-process communication to a Python process, okay? Usually serializing it, deserializing it again, copying it, then running your highly, optim your highly optimized Python code, and then doing the whole thing back again. Okay, so, so more than 90% of your time, what you're doing is you're copying strings in memory and serializing and deserializing. Okay, and, and things take, you know, tens of minutes or hours uh, or days just because of that. 
So, so the first thing we, we did is we came, is we said, no, that's it. Let's do that. The first thing we did, we said, okay, let's write this. Let's write a library, an NLP library that works directly on top of uh, uh, Spark data frames. Okay, so it has no external dependencies. It's written from scratch in Scala. Okay, there's zero copying in memory uh, from data frames. Uh, we actually, Databricks guys, we're, 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 uh, do amazing. They help us with code reviews and making sure that the kind of optimizations we do are in line with what they're planning. Uh, and what you have is, uh, you, have, you have Spark from the bottom up. You have everything that comes with Spark uh, ML. So some things like, you know, TFIDF, a distributed topic modeling are already there, so we said, oh, we should just reuse them, right? That's excellent. And then a Spark NLP basically added another set of annotators and features. Okay, so, so you kind of classic NLP stuff, uh, lemmatization, tokenization, part of speech, name native recognition, and those kind of core features. And uh, let's talk a bit about, oh, I see what's going on. Uh, so let's, let's talk a bit about the result. Uh, so as you do this, first of all, you have, you, you have a library that's natively distributed. So we knew it was going to scale. But the first question was, okay, how does it perform in a singular machine? Uh, and this is a benchmark uh, that's, I mean, it's published on the O'Reilly blog, so there's like 15 pages worth of, you know, the detail of how you produce this benchmark. Uh, but this is a test we did uh, on a single machine. This is a 16 gigabyte memory, full core Intel kind of non-optimized CPU. So this is like very mid-range dev machine. Uh, and we, it was a very simple pipeline, sentence boundary, tokenization, part of speech, and it was kind of, okay, train your own model, uh, and you, you can see the result. Uh, so the result was really, a, you know, and, and in most cases, depending on how much data, uh, you get between one and two orders of magnitude speed up. Okay, uh, and many people, when they think about Spark, they say, oh, when I need to go to a cluster and I have millions of documents, I need it. Uh, what's good to remember, and we were a bit surprised with this at the beginning, uh, the, the Spark guys were not, uh, is uh, Spark right now, it does not use the Java memory model. Okay, so in Java, every string is 48 bytes. Okay, that's not the case here. Spark does its own. Spark does its own memory allocation. Okay, Spark does its own garbage collection. Spark does its own caching. It actually uses L1, L2, L3 cache. Okay, so, so in many cases, we kind of, we're going back to the highly optimized C, C stuff we had to do manually, but now that's been done for us. Okay, so, so definitely on a single machine, you should expect much better. I keep going back, okay. <laughs> uh, the other thing that you get is scaling. Uh, and, and kind of, okay, if it still takes, you know, four minutes and you need it in four seconds, you can do it on a cluster. Uh, the cool thing is uh, with Spark, you can largely do it with absolutely zero code changes. Okay, meaning just take the same code, okay, and just, oh, just, just do it as a Databricks Cloud job, do it as an EMR job, right, do it as a kind of an on-demand job. Okay, same code, uh, here's, uh, you know, we did one example uh, on the previous code, we got, two and a half X speed up on just a four node EMR cluster. Uh, again, no configuration changes. Uh, of course, if you do optimize the configuration of your Spark cluster, you can get much more, much more than that. Okay, and in general, this, the, you know, we, we do get not linear, but very close to linear speed ups on clusters as you go. And this is basically the only open source library that does that. So in 2018, we went further. Uh, we built two kinds of pipelines. Uh, light pipelines are intended when you're working either alone on your machine uh, or if you're building an API. And then really most of your questions are one-off, right? So send one document, process it, get me a result via REST API. Uh, so there are light pipelines. Light pipelines are basically, we, we went fairly deep into, uh, you know, in, into Scala and, uh, and ACA. Uh, light pipelines, uh, do not create a Spark job every time you, you ask a request, so even we don't have that initial overhead. Uh, so light pipelines give you, basically it was another order of magnitude speed up for small data on top of what we had before. Uh, and uh, in terms of scalable pipelines, really this is your only choice if, if you need to go on a cluster. Okay. I just have to give up. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of how uh, how this looks in code, so this is a Python example, uh, and really, I mean, the, the, there are lots of notebooks and examples uh, online, uh, but basically, the pipeline is a pyspark.ml.pipeline. You can combine stages. Uh, so one nice thing is that uh, if you look at this pipeline, 
So I start uh, with raw text, I build a document out of it, I tokenize, I, I do stemming, I do normalization. So these are Spark NLP uh, annotators or code. Okay, then I want to build more features. So I, I uh, remove stop words, I compute TF and IDF. This is stuff that we did not write, this just comes with Spark ML. Okay, but, but the, it, it's completely frictionless in terms of the API, it's the same API. And then I run LDA. So the other nice thing is that I kind of, I can combine my NLP pipeline and ML pipeline into one pipeline, which you want so that you can experiment faster. Okay, and then you can run it as one thing. So, so Pete basically does the training, right, transform, transforms it on a, on a specific data set. And the cool thing is that because Spark does lazy evaluation, only when you call fit, it actually builds the execution plan. Okay, so, so if you're looking at optimization, also either single machine levels of caching or on a cluster, only at this point, right, basically I tell the, the, the kind of the, the Spark optimizer, look, here's everything I need to do. Okay, go and find kind of the best execution path. Okay, which is very powerful in terms of the, the performance you get. And, and in a sense, the, the, the benchmarks I showed were for, for like the simple pipelines. Okay, the more complex your pipeline gets, uh, the, more, uh, the more gap in performance you'll see versus what this gives you versus kind of traditional libraries. Okay, so that's about performance. Okay, so, so there are some nice fundamental things we did. And, and for you, really, you just, you know, you, so we just, you just a Python library, uh, or, you know, we have it in Java, we have it in Scala, and people have it in production in all those languages. Uh, so, you know, we, we spent part of the last year working through the bugs of how all of that actually works. Uh, and, and really, you don't have to think about it and you get it for free. So that's performance. Uh, so performance is, uh, you know, some people commented before, you can get to very high performance if you don't care about accuracy, you know? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and, and you can. Uh, <laughs> but, okay, how do we, but like, okay, that's nice. I want to make sure if I do NLP, I'm actually uh, getting the more, most accurate results, which is important. So. Uh, the first question is, what exactly is state of the art? Uh, and the important thing is, state of the art is not a marketing term. State of the art is an academic term, okay? Which basically means, look, if I, if I do, for example, name entity recognition, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, so there are public benchmarks, meaning academics paid, had a grant, paid people to label a data set and come say, okay, here's a, here's a public benchmark, right? S same way we did with, uh, you know, with squad, right? With question answering. Uh, with language identification, right? So, so someone, uh, or, you know, or, or, or ImageNet, someone pays to build a nice, uh, well-labeled set, okay? And then you, you release it to the community and you say, okay, you know, go, you know, go crazy, see, see what's the best you can do. Okay, so state of the art refers, okay, what, what's the best you can do on kind of peer-reviewed uh, results on, on widely accepted kind of academic benchmarks? Uh, and uh, most, of the state-of-the-art results today in the most commonly used NLP tasks are deep learning based, okay? And one of the things we did with the library is basically we've implemented and built in some of those graphs, okay? And some of them you can actually use without even knowing, you know, without even ha having the deep learning library or knowledge within. Here are some of the results, so there's the public benchmarks uh, on what you can achieve. So uh, NER, the identification, event detection, a kind of event normalization, a person normalization, a negation detection, a possibility detection, those kinds of aspects. Uh, so to show basically some, some of the tasks that are there, so one of the, the, the common tasks in NLP is, is named entity recognition. And with named entity recognition, you have a sentence. And your goal is to recognize one or more types of entities and just mark them in the text, so annotate. Okay, so uh, uh, Monica and Chandler met at Central Park. So Central Park is a location, Monica and Chandler are people. Okay, the important catch is that uh, you need to know that Monica and Chandler are people, uh, even though it does not come from dictionary, right? You need to know that Chandler is not the city of Chandler, Arizona, right? And Central Park, of course, is not a real place, right? It's the kind of imaginary place where they met, you know, on friends. Okay, but you should still know it's a place because it, it's, you know, when, when you say met at, Okay, then what you'll get afterwards in English is either a place or a time, okay, and this is not a time. Okay, so you'd expect the models to kind of figure that out and know what it, you know, that, that this is how we meet, right, in the real world. Um, the latest and best, basically best results in deep learning are based on uh, networks that are in general. It's a bidirectional uh, LSTM networks for tokens, uh, CNN layers for characters, uh, and uh, uh, domain-specific word embeddings. Uh, sometimes you also have a CRF at the end, sometimes you don't. 
and that's kind of the structure of the network. And those, that's what's been producing for not just healthcare, for several domains have been producing the best results over the past year. So here's one example. We have a paper that was just published July 2017 that's already productized and implemented in the library. So basically, we have a team of people. Will, all we do is we read those latest papers. We try to reproduce them. But sometimes they reproduce, sometimes they don't. If they do, uh, there's a lot of work to productize them. Okay, meaning actually get to a point where you can train on your own domain-specific data set. It runs distributed. Uh, it does caching of models, right? So you have issues like, uh, you know, where the embeddings can be more than a gigabyte. So you really need to, to do caching and uh, share them across threads, those kinds of uh, problems. Uh, and really get to a point that we have something that's production-grade, enterprise-grade, and, and uh, repeatable. Uh, another example is entity resolution. So entity resolution is, is the problem, okay. So, so I, uh, I understood that Monica is a person. Now I need to know which Monica. Okay, so, so can you get me a link to, to, a, you know, to a customer ID? Right? Can you get me a link to a product ID if it's a product? Okay, can you get me a link to, you know, to, the, to the Wikipedia page, right? If it's an organization or person I should know about. Okay, so how do I normalize you know, IBM and international business machines and Big Blue? Or in this example, how do I normalize renal failure and decreased renal function into one code? Okay, so uh, entity resolution is, is the case, uh, is the problem of, okay, how do I take those strings and actually normalize them into, into objects in my database? Okay, uh, because if I'm building a knowledge graph, Okay, I need to know this person is, has this disease, right? This company patented this gene. Okay, this customer complained about this product. I need, I need structured object uh, that I map to. Okay, and, and then also the, there's a set of academic benchmarks for this style of problems. Uh, and also the most recent uh, nice results are deep learning results. Uh, it's a different type of network, uh, but also what we've done here is basically we've pre-coded the network in TensorFlow, we've productized it, we've made it kind of more uh, reusable and robust. We also trained into some of, our, some of our own internal data sets. And now it just comes with the library. Okay, so within Spark NLP, if you come and say, oh, just the same way as, as you saw in the pipeline, you had a tokenizer, you can add a deep learning NER, okay, and that's it. Right, we, we have kind of TensorFlow packed in the back end, you can use GPUs, other things, that's all you need. And you know, to train your own data sets or obviously run a pipeline. The biggest thing recently, in, in NLP in general, is having more complex word embeddings. Uh, and, and without going to the details, uh, word embeddings are kind of something that you use almost in every other model. Okay, uh, so basically, if you don't know what word embeddings are, it's like, oh, you have a model, okay, you're doing sentiment analysis, you're doing spelling checking, it's like, just add word embeddings, you get a few points of accuracy. That's a really simplistic way, <laughs> a simplistic way to think about it. Uh, but if you look at 2018, so does anyone know why, who, who those two are? Yes, those are the two biggest things in NLP in 2018. Really? Here. So, in May, the Allen AI Institute published a paper that made a lot of waves called, you know, about ELMO. And basically what they did, they kind of said, oh, look, really word embeddings, the way we do them, we say they capture semantic equivalence, blah, blah, but it's really pretty stupid. What we do is we take a word, then we take the words around it, like whether it's, you know, three or four or five words around it, and we say, oh, if two words appear close in the text, then we say that you know, they're semantically relevant. Okay, that's it, that's it, right? And then you build a lot of marketing hype on top of it. And, you know, and it does work. Uh, but what they did is they come and said, look, what if we look at sentences, full sentences? What if we look at full paragraphs? What if it's not just about how close the words are, but what if we start looking at, at, at parts of speech, right? And, and kind of how the words are connected. Okay, and kind of just try to build basically deeper contextualized embeddings. Okay, now, uh, there's a lot of really cool detail. You should read the paper, it's, it's actually really nice. Uh, some nice intuition there if you're into deep learning. Uh, but the even nicer thing is that if you don't care about any of this, it's like at the end you get an embeddings file, and it's kind of just, just replace this embeddings file with this new embeddings file, and hope all your NLP tasks go up by two or three points of accuracy. Okay, so it's nice package, nicely packaged. And this made a whole lot of noise. Three weeks ago, Google uh, Research released BERT, Okay, uh, which, uh, which uh, and it's a larger model. One of the things we're looking at is that can we actually do it in terms of the memory it requires. Uh, but that was the first thing to basically beat Elmo on a set of like 12 different NLP tasks. So question answering, co-reference resolution, uh, I think the negation detection, they did language understanding, did language modeling, so next word prediction, 
So, so a whole set of pretty useful things, if you're doing search, if you're doing uh, translation, if you're doing bots, uh, and made a whole lot of noise. Two days ago, okay, on Wednesday, was a really big day for the NLP community. Uh, that morning, Google actually released uh, the code and the pre-trained embedding uh, for BERT on GitHub, so this is now public and open source. Okay, and so there are quite a few people who are now jumping on this and trying to produce this and trying to check, really you know, check the results on their own data sets. Okay, uh, so this is the cool new thing. So we, uh, we, we haven't productized it, but this is kind of in the team, this is now what we're working on. Uh, so that you know, in a few months we'll have to come and tell you, oh, we, you know, well, we still have state of the art results because we actually productize this. The problem with claiming you do state of the art stuff is that the state of the art keeps moving. Uh, you know, it kind of, <laughs> you know, you can only do it basically for two, three months, and then some, you know, some researcher decided that, you know, that they need to, to do it better, and, you know. You're back to square one. Uh, on the other hand, it's really fun to do this, uh, because it kind of, by definition, you work on the coolest new stuff. So, but, you know, but I find ways to complain. Uh, everybody does. So, uh, the other thing it means is that uh, if you look at the kind of how the architecture evolved, so at the beginning, if you remember the previous diagram, the 2017, we had Spark and, and Spark ML, and then our library. Uh, so now it's a bit more involved. Uh, so Spark is still there, and, and it's all the same pipeline. Now we basically have embedded TensorFlow as well. Okay, and, and we, we use TensorFlow for the uh, uh, kind of the pre-built models, uh, the pre-built graphs. Uh, we've done a lot of engineering work to make sure uh, we don't actually have to go to a Python process. So we use the uh, half-broken TensorFlow JNI interface to make sure we can actually do this from the JVM. Uh, and that's really where a lot of the work on the time to optimize this uh, went into. Um, uh, we also had a lot of functionality. Uh, so if now basic is basically what you would get with NLTK or Spacey. Uh, now we've added things like uh, automated spelling correction and spell detection. Uh, there's sentiment analysis and some emotion analysis models. Uh, there's OCR work. Okay, so, so you can actually do uh, OCR directly from the library. Uh, and, and the nice thing is, I mean, OCR is, is, half of it is about, okay, how, how do you get the image to text? But a lot of the NLP work is afterwards. How do you deal with things like, you know, page breaks, uh, enumerations, lists, callouts, tables? Okay, uh, so you can actually, if some, you know, if a sentence ends at the page and begins at the next page, but you have headers and footer, you actually take it as one sentence, so you can actually extract the right content for me. Okay, so, so that's a lot of the work that's added. And, and really, all of this is now, you know, it's open source, please use it, enjoy it, send bugs, send requests, and, and you know, we go from there. Uh, the other thing that deep learning means, it means that uh, there's, there's a lot of other optimizations that people expect. Uh, so for example, you need to be able to train on GPUs and run on GPUs. Uh, so we've done that work, and that's really, that's, that's not data science work, it's engineering work. Uh, we, we have a build of the library that's specifically on top of the Intel optimized uh, a machine learning library, right? So there, there's, uh, I think, uh, uh, D and K. Uh, but basically, there's a Spark optimized library, uh, and there's a TensorFlow optimized library for the latest Intel and Xeon processors. So we have that build. Uh, and we also done some work with Databricks. Okay, uh, so also basically, assume you get, really, it's, it's the only library that's really optimized uh, for the latest and greatest kind of compute platform. Okay, so uh, we talked about what is the library? Basically, you know, it's a Python library. You can do pip install Spark NLP. It's a Java library, right? So it's on Maven Central. It's on Spark packages, right? Or, you know, you, you always have to build from scratch, right? From GitHub, it's, it's open source. Uh, we spoke about the work that was done for performance and scale. We spoke about accuracy, okay? And obviously, all of this is work in progress, as, as it should. Now, how do you actually use it? Um, and this is what people often ask. So uh, the first thing, that people ask is, okay, let's say I need to whatever, I'm, 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 I need to extract uh, data from, whatever, from financial disclosures, right, and, and build a knowledge graph, or, or I need to, uh, to look at you know, legal transcripts and try to understand what was the result of the hearing and what kind of hearing, or I'm doing customer service, right, and I need to extract, you know, uh, what product did the customer complain about, or whether it should be escalate, and what was the estimate, you know, you know, those kinds of under understanding what's going on question. The first question is, okay, why can I just use, like, can I just get the model and use it, or, or use a cloud solution? And there's a very simple answer. It doesn't work. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And, and really, in this case, say, don't believe me. Go and check for yourself. Okay, so, what you need to do. Okay, here's the problem. The problem is, we don't speak one language. Okay? Uh, human language is very, very context-specific. So, when I speak to you, 
Okay, versus when I write an email. Okay, versus when I speak to my wife. Okay, I speak different languages. Okay, meaning I use a different vocabulary. I use a different grammar. Okay, there is different meaning to the words. Okay, it's a different language. Okay, there is a reason why, you know, if you want to be able to understand a language, you, you go to low school, it takes a few years. If you want to understand medical records, okay, you go to, it takes, like, you need to learn the language. Okay, it, it takes as much time uh, to learn to understand, you know, financial disclosures as it takes to learn German. Okay, Spanish is probably a bit easier, but still German. <laughs> okay, uh, and, 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 and therefore the models do not work. So what you need to do, there are links here. Okay, so that, you know, the, all the cloud providers have kind of online, there's an online webpage, you can actually try it. Okay, and what you'll see is that it works on kind of general language. So, so if you put stuff on Wikipedia, if you put stuff on news, it works really well. Okay, if you have any domain specific questions, where you, you need to, 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 to make it understand, okay, this is a social media post. Okay, so we don't have full sentences, right? Or, or this is a medical record, we don't use subjects. Okay, we just don't. Right, uh, uh, this is a uh, you know, SMS, so we use, uh, we use emojis. So emojis are a language whose entire and only purpose is sentiment analysis, right, to convey my sentiment. Right, if, if you haven't trained for that, you will not know. Okay, uh, so, so I would say just actually, you know, you can actually try it and see for yourself what results you get. So here's one example, so we do a lot of work in healthcare. Uh, so this is an example of actual uh, emergency room notes. Okay, and the, the problem was this was actually a time series forecasting problem. Uh, from all the people in the ER, I want to know who is expected to actually be admitted and for how long. Okay, so, so you know, if you come in with a broken arm, you're not going to get into the hospital, we're going to do a cast and send you home. If you come in with the chest pain, you definitely stay the night, and there's all the stuff in between. Okay, uh, so uh, you need to understand the text, and you have sentences like, uh, you know, since the other day, 10 slash 10, concert Tylenol one hour ago, plus nausea, diaphoretic, mid ABD radiates to back. Okay, beautiful sentence says, if you talk to doctors, this is all they need. It's short, it's to the point, I go to your bed, it's late at night, I have many people waiting, this is, this is like good. Okay, I mean, those people are in trouble, but you know, the text is good. Uh, and you have things like, you need to know that 10 slash 10 is, for example, in this context, it's level of pain. Okay, uh, plus uh, uh, nausea means the person is nauseated. Okay, mid ABD, it means that there's a pain in the middle abdomen, it radiates to the back. Okay, and this is kind of jargon here. What's interesting, none of these sentences use the word patient, okay? Like, none of these are actually valid English sentences, none of them. None of them use the word pain, okay? Because, you know, if you got to the ER, you know, it's not, not, not for the free TV, right? I mean, you just don't need to write it. And, and this, is just, this is just how this works. So, uh, what we want is we want to extract features, okay? We want to know in, in very structured ways, right? So we can build a classifier on top of it. Where does it hurt? When did it start? What body part? And did you take anything at home? Okay, so we don't over, overdo you. Okay, that's a very domain-specific problem, right? The only way you do this is if you train models based on this language specific for this domain. Okay, and the main thing is that really this is the same for every domain. In this specific case, I mean, if you take those three sentences, copy and paste them into those six, you know, six UIs, okay, you get nothing. I would say two of the six, it knew that Tylenol is a product, right? So the NER said Tylenol is a product, okay? But that's it, okay? That's the only mark they had at all, okay? And in general, this is what you need to face, okay? And, and forget, like, other human languages, so Japanese, Chinese, Russian. This is all in English. A another example is sentiment analysis, okay? We're also, all the cloud providers, there's a lot of open source stuff to come say, oh, you sentiment analysis, API, you, you send it, and we tell you what's going on. So here's an example project we had where the, the goal was, uh, so this was kind of an, uh, one of the auto trading companies. And, and they said, oh, there, there's a, you know, they do the classic um, time series decomposition and try to predict the market. And then they said, look, on top of it, we, we want to know, you know, we know that sometimes people, you know, they tweet or they publish analyst papers, and this obviously impacts, immediately impacts uh, uh, stock prices, right? So, so can we analyze the text and see if it's a positive or negative sentiment? Right, and he said we don't even have to be very accurate because we just take the sentiment, whatever it is the cloud provider gives us, and we, we then try to apply it in the model. And if it helps, we get some lift, right? And, and the model we learn when, it tell, you know, when to use this feature and when, when not to use this feature. And they tried it, and they got, uh, yeah, um, they got zero lift. 
Okay, they got nothing. And they were flustered for several months trying this. Okay, uh, because they sent the text and, and just the whole thing didn't work. Even though, even when they send examples, right, or, of tweets or posts and articles that obviously had a huge impact uh, on, you know, on stock prices. And the reason is, uh, is as follows. It's also, it's, it's like any machine learning problem. It's really good on what you train it on. Okay, sentiment analysis classically is trained on a uh, customer service use cases. Okay, so a, a customer calls, okay, are they angry, are they sad, are they upset, or are they happy, or whatever. Okay, uh, in the customer service settings, okay, you use a lot of emotion words. Okay, I'm devastated, I'm upset, you crooks, right, what the hell are you doing? Okay, uh, when, you, uh, uh, when, you, when you give uh, stock recommendations, you don't use emotion words. Right, so the Financial Times writes a scathing article about a company Okay, I mean, it's, it's going to look very dry if you look at the headline. Okay, like you have to be in the business to, you know, to look at it in the morning and say, oh man, they're just killing them, right? Uh, or like this is the best piece ever. Okay, uh, so because you have sentences like, oh, uh, Citron shock Twitter near term target 25. Okay, like this was abuse of the Twitter stock, right? They sent it completely down. Uh, in Square, so this was something that was published two months ago. Some analyst, okay, wrote, and, and actually, he didn't publish any of the data. Okay, someone is told that that month uh, Square did more than uh, more than Venmo. Okay, Square and Venmo never corroborated this. Nobody knows if it actually happened. Okay, but this sent Square up 10% that day. Okay, because what happened in financial services? But it's about reputation. But who says it? Right, it's about change from the previous day. Okay, and and you know it's kind of obvious if you're in the business. It's just not what these models are trained on. Okay, so just one more example, really. You need to understand your domain, because your domain uses its own language, okay, and that's what you need to train. Okay, and that's, that's every time. I mean, I've been doing this for six years. I'm yet to see a case where you can actually just go and reuse a model. So, train your own models. Uh, next thing you need to do is you need to pair your NLP scientist or data scientist uh, with someone uh, who really is a master of the specific language. Okay, so think about it as, look, for my project, there's a language I need to understand. Okay, and, and so here's a really simple example, right? So obviously, look, if you're doing pathology report, you need a pathologist. But even you're doing simple things. So you're doing reviews. Okay, and you know, we, we, can, we can run a vote here and come and say, okay, read this. What do you think? Is this a 3.4 point or 5 point review? Right, five star review. Okay, the problem is there's going to be a variance. Okay, and, and here's what happened. This, this happens a lot uh, in, in LP space because language is fuzzy. If we have 80% agreement, right, it means that 80% is the, is the maximum theoretical upper limit on accuracy, okay? Uh, because above 80% is basically random, right? You can get another group of people in the room, they, they'll think it's another 80%. Okay, everything you get above 80% is by definition overfitting, right? Because you're overfitting to a random sample. Okay, uh, so what you need is you need to have people who understand, okay, look, here's how we do restaurant reviews. Here's, why, here's when we call these four stars or two stars. Okay, uh, they argue about it, they meet weekly, they go over the ones they disagree, right? They, you know, somebody, you know, somebody kind of decides when there are disagreements, right? And, and the question is, okay, like forget all the data science stuff. How does the team of people get to a point where they have just internal agreement of 95% on the same reviews that they write? Okay, there are many cases uh, we've seen in, uh, uh, in legal, and in healthcare, like for example, healthcare a clinical coding, if you know the problem, so basically it's the problem of, uh, here's your medical record, uh, what, what's the billable procedure, what's the billable diagnosis? Okay, it's fairly well known that across teams, you, you often get 70% agreements, and uh, we need the same person, so intra-coder inter, agreement is 88%. Okay, so you send the same thing to the same person a week later, okay, you get 88% agreement. Okay, so if anyone tells you they have 95% accuracy, I mean, that, that's, just plain, that's just plain BS, basically. Works well in sales. Overfitting is a salesperson best tool. Yes, you should, yeah. that, that you can use. Uh, so, um, another thing that happens is uh, uh, really sometimes we really need domain experts to agree. So, anyone knows what those two uh, precedents are about? No? Okay. So those are actually two really important cases. Those are the two cases that form the basis of the, the e-discovery industry. Okay, uh, so those are the, the cases where uh, judges actually went through search results one by one, 
right? And Kemi said, okay, yes, you can use this machine and this algorithm, okay, when, when, you need, you know, when, you, when you need to show discovery papers. Okay, so if I sue a company, I say, okay, okay I, I want all the documents and all the emails you have about the oil spill from wherever. Okay, it used to be that you need lawyers to sit one by one and decide what to send. And now you can use an algorithm, so you can put queries in a search engine. Okay, but that relevance algorithm went to review by experts. Right, and then obviously there were a few years where there was uncertainty of what will be allowed and get approved. Okay, but that, that's often what you need. A, another question people ask, how do you start with NLP? Uh, and it's actually, it's a pretty simple question. Uh, start with a problem uh, where you have an existing model that's based on structured data. Okay, so, so for example, if you look at the healthcare example in the ER, I want to know, you know, how likely is this person to be admitted? Okay, uh, we can start, you can start without NLP. Okay, uh, look, the likelihood you will get admitted depends on some, you know, I can use structured data. It depends on your age, it depends on what insurance you have, it depends on uh, your previous ER visits, right, so are you, you know, are you a frequent fly or not, okay, uh, and the, uh, the day of the week, okay? So if it's a weekend, I tell you, look, there's half the people here, like, do you really want to spend the night here, right? Okay, uh, and obviously, uh, these are not, this is not an accurate model, because this model does not consider why am I actually there, right? Like, what's my actual complaint? But, but these models give you, you know, they give you like a you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.65 AUC. So start with a model where you have some uh, baseline, low baseline structure data, uh, but start with a case where if you'd ask a human to do it, they would only look at the free text. Okay, so for example, you know, if I sit in a hospital bed and the doctor comes, they don't say, oh, show me, show me your lab, show me your, your prescription, let's look at your previous codes. Right, so, okay, what, what the previous doctor wrote, right. Okay, you know, if I'm in a customer service situation, right, and, and you know, the, the manager comes in and comes, okay, uh, uh, you know, we need to escalate this case, Right, so show me this customer's purchase history, right? show me the dates of the credit card numbers. Okay, <laughs> show me, like, what did they say? Okay, so, so look for the cases where kind of intuitively you know that the real features and the real data you need is within the text. Okay, and then you can start with structure model and just upgrade from there, right? Uh, because then you have the baseline model, so kind of you know where the model fits in your business process, right? how you're going to use it, and you can see you can get like really nice kind of, you know, 5, 10, 15 point accuracy gains. Right, if you know that kind of the actual content that no one ever used is in the text. Okay, so that's where I recommend you start and go from there. Uh, in terms of setting expectations, okay, so when people ask you, okay, how good is this going to be? How accurate is this going to be? Okay, so can you actually do, you know, when you say you can understand language, like what can you actually do? Uh, so one thing you should say is in general today, okay, so we said it's an incomplete problem, I cannot solve general language understanding, we can do as well as humans in general, as well as humans or even slightly better on most highly, highly specific tasks. Okay, so is this patient diabetic or not? Right, is this, a, you know, is this a, a filing, right, kind of a retraction of a previous one or not? Okay, uh, so that I would set that expectation today. Also, if, if you know what you're doing, you're using the, the latest deep learning techniques. Uh, the only thing really to, uh, to tell your managers is that uh, humans are, are, are bad, pretty much, you know, they're not. Don't trust them. Um, uh, so, and, and specifically it means that, you know, if you're 95% accurate, for example, if you're 95% accurate with name and entity recognition, right, it, it means that 5% of the things will be wrong. Okay, it means when you look at the page of text and you look at the entity, there's going to be several wrong results on that page. Okay, and one, one thing about NLP is that uh, those results, I mean, it's just more visible. Okay, because one page is actually a lot of words. Okay, so people will see errors. Okay, and, and people will, will think that's a problem uh, because, uh, uh, you know, people, especially domain experts within the language, kind of think, oh, you know, I can read it and mark it, why can't the system do it? Okay, uh, so what you need to know is that 90, 95% accuracy will still get you some errors and, and just make sure you set the expectation to begin with. So, that's all I had. So we spoke about Spark NLP, we spoke about its performance and scale, we spoke about accuracy, we spoke about some things that, that are kind of repeatable, and mostly plan to build your own domain specific models and make sure we have a library that does that. Uh, it's all open source, there's a home page, a lot of you know, examples, documentation, there's a Slack community, you can ask questions if things go wrong. Uh, you're very welcome to fork the code, and I'm always happy to talk to people about the project you're doing so I you know, can learn what's going on and continue improving this. Thank you. Thank you.